I wanted to tee up Jeff first is what I like is, you know, Jeff's a really smart guy. He's a really good guy, fun to be around, fun to talk to. Um, but he has a really practical um, side side to him. He's not just a typical data scientist, AIML, where they only think about that part of the world. He thinks about how these things should be architected so that they can fit into systems and into enterprises. And so um, it's very interesting. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff and, um, you know, there will be questions and answers. Um, you know, Jeff will take questions in line. Um, if he starts falling behind, then we might hold questions a little bit. But anyway, Jeff, over to you, buddy. Uh, thanks a lot, Phil. That was, that was a very nice introduction. Not not sure I entirely earned it, but, but I'll take it. Uh, just some upfront stuff. Like Phil said, um, I'm happy to drone on at you for a while, but uh, this is probably more interesting for you and more interesting for me if, if there's more uh, engagement, a few more questions. Um, that way I, I can make sure that I'm speaking to, you know, the people in the room and not just who I imagine is here. And, uh, and also I get to learn something, right? I, I get to understand a little more about how other people are engaging with the material. So uh, having said that, uh, I'll, I'll also quickly say, you know, data science is a pretty new-ish field, um, or, or it's not, right? Neural networks have actually been around since the 60s uh, as a theoretical concept. And I, I kind of laugh now, they were used in the 80s and early 90s in linguistics research. And so that's how I encountered them. My PhD is in neuroscience. Uh, one, of the, one of the big things in neuroscience is, you know, how does language work? And so back in the 90s, there were a couple of guys, uh, Rumo Hart and McClelland, who are trying to train neural networks to understand how kids learned, uh, uh, especially irregular verbs in English. And so it's been a really interesting ride, right? Over the last 30 years, we've gone from a two or three layer neural network with several nodes to millions of dollars just to train a single model uh, for models that can do just extraordinary natural language processing and computer vision tasks. And so I think one of the one of the fun parts about being from neuroscience is that uh, neuroscience is also too big. It's like data science, right? You can't study neuroscience and not be able to talk to people who do cellular level stuff and people who do systems level stuff. Um, but there are very different techniques and very different backgrounds that go into that. And I think data science and machine learning is kind of the same way, right? You can get way down into hardware level optimization. Um, you can be way on, on my end, right? Which is other people are going to build the tools. I'm just going to use them. Um, but over the last few years, I've been thinking really hard about how hard it is. I'm not alone, right? Uh, Gartner, uh, in, the, in the abstract, I'm quoting a Gartner study that says something like 75% of machine learning deployments fail, or machine learning projects and companies fail. And, and it turns out, you know, that, that field is complex and sort of hard enough that we probably need to put some more thought into how to make that professional and how to do integration uh, with machine learning and software systems in a way that is not so prone to failure or so risky. So that's that's sort of the, the broad overview of what I want to talk about here. Um, we're going to pay a quick legalese tax. Uh, these slides should all be available after the talk. So if you're um, interested, you're, you're more than welcome to, to look through those. Um, very briefly, right over the next hour, the ride we're going to take is in three parts. Um, the first one should be pretty brief just to get us all on the same page and make sure we're, we're using words the same way. I'm going to talk about what machine learning is to me and hopefully to other people. Uh, I'm briefly going to talk about what makes machine learning so hard, which is mostly related to the stuff that I'm doing at SEI right now. Uh, and finally, and, and maybe the, the longest third here, um, I want to talk about some challenges that I've seen personally where startups were trying to integrate uh, machine learning with existing software systems. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's a rocky process. And I, I'm hoping that I can start to generalize about why it's so rocky and, and ways that we can deal with that. So machine learning um, is pretty broad and it often gets lumped in with uh, statistics and artificial intelligence. And so you'll hear a lot of people say AIML or DSML, and there are good reasons for that, right? Um, a lot of AI makes use of machine learning as a core component. There's substantial overlap among similar uh, or very simple models between statistics and machine learning. In fact, there's a really good paper uh, by Leo Brinkman, who was a statistician out at University of California. Um, who's, I believe he's passed away, unfortunately, but uh, he had a great paper in about 2008 where he was outlining, you know, here's why the field of statistics is failing in light of machine learning. Machine learning is so much more powerful. 
Uh, it's so much more flexible. We wouldn't, if we just want to do prediction, right? If we don't, if we don't want to do causal inference, if we want to know what's going to happen next in the world, then machine learning is the way to do it. And so, you know, abandon your statistics uh, and think only about these models. And one of the popular statistical replies is, you know, what you're talking about are just models that are so complex that we can't write the math down for them. Right. And that, that's really how I think about machine learning models is that they're, they're really good algorithms for doing prediction and they probably overlap with statistics in some important ways. Um, and so for me, uh, models and machine learning or statistics are interchangeable and the, the similar format they have, right. I'm, I'm showing you a picture of something that probably looks a little like a neural net, but the idea is that you take some, some input data and a label, which is not included in this image. And you say, how do I learn a conditional dependence between the label that I have and the, and the input data? In this case, I'm gonna talk about images. It doesn't have to be that right way, right? In a, in a second, I'll, I'll talk about some other domains, but broadly, I think there are about three steps or three ways that you um, create or use a machine learning model. And the first way is encompassed by this entire picture, right? It's that you have to conceive of what sort of problem do I have? Like what data have I encountered that I want to apply machine learning to? And so that might mean that, you know, you're in computer vision and image space. And so uh, you have some classical techniques or some deep learning or, or uh, uh, neural network techniques that you want to apply. It might be that you're doing time series modeling, right? And so then there are some nice classical statistical techniques um, like ARIMA and, and that whole family of, of autoregressive models that you can apply. So uh, the, the first thing is, right, specifying a model architecture that you're going to deal with. The second one is, is training the actual model, right? So I keep saying model. What we're really talking about are a bunch of numbers that almost always are either going to be searched uh, in sort of a sequential pattern for tree-based models or aggregated in some way for almost everything else. And so you're gonna take inputs, weight those inputs, combine them in some way and produce an output. Um, so creating the weights that comprise that model, sort of the second thing, right? You've got, first you create the architecture, then you have to in, like instantiate the model as, as a trained model, as these weights. And finally, you draw inferences from a model, right? So now that I, I have this corpus of pictures, I have some labels on what's in the pictures. I train a big neural network to do that. Uh, maybe the first neural nets that were really successful at that were AlexNet and ImageNet. Uh, but now, right, uh, as you can download a Python package, import a pre-trained neural network and give it a picture of a cat and it'll tell you that's a cat with pretty high accuracy, right? And so that inference step where I, now I have a set model and all I'm gonna do is give the conditioning information and then produce an output uh, is, is sort of the third way that a model gets used. And the reason that I think that's important is that a lot of discussion about creating software that, is, uh, that includes a machine learning component or machine learning enabled software is, is I think the, the term that gets used quite a bit. Uh, it's, it's often the case that people conflate the system's need to, re to train a model with the need to produce inferences from it. Um, and that I think is gonna be one of, the, one of the important things that delineates really relatively simple systems to include machine learning in with incredibly complex ones. So the, the lay of the land in machine learning, uh, I, I think reinforcement learning gets a, a little too much credit in these sorts of graphics, but um, we're gonna keep it. <laughs> because other people think it gets so much credit. Um, the, big, the big sort of problem types are supervised and unsupervised learning. Supervised learning, you have conditioning information and a label. You want to learn the relationship between those. Um, that function ends up being your trained model, right, to translate the conditioning information into the label. Uh, you have uh, unsupervised learning. And this is, this is like, I want to know how my data group together. Right. This is when you make a recommender system, when, Net, when Netflix wants to recommend you a movie, right, they don't, they don't look at all of the attributes of all of their movie catalog and say, how do I predict the thing that you'll want? They say, what's the watch industry or what's the watch history for people who have watched similar things to you? We're going to recommend those movies to you. Um, or at least that's how they should be doing it. Who knows what now they're just going to advertise to you. Um, and reinforcement learning is uh, 
kind of generally how to traverse a space um, could be a, a, an intangible space um, by allowing agents to navigate it and looking at the cost that those those agents uh, incur over that navigation process. So it's it's not the case that there's there's one singular thing that that is machine learning. There are there are a couple different um, groupings of relevant algorithms within that space, and you know a, a big Frankly, a, a difficulty in machine learning is understanding what sort of problem you have in front of you or how to compose different existing algorithms to, to solve maybe more complex problems, right? One of the things that we'll talk about later is that uh, you, can, you can easily run into problems that are easy, easy to articulate, um, but, but require you to create an ensemble or, a, or to compose multiple models together to solve different problems um, because, it's, because it's unfortunately the case that you can't necessarily get enough data to just say like, if I build a sufficiently complex neural network, uh, I don't have to think about the, the design or, or underlying characteristics of the model architecture. Uh, I wanna draw a big uh, distinction between machine learning and artificial intelligence though. And the reason for that is that they so often get conflated as like the magical dust that you put on projects that gets investor money or will make something work better. Right, and one one distinction I think of, I think of this as being sort of a Venn diagram. Right, there's plenty of artificial intelligence that has nothing to do with machine learning, and the mechanical thermostat is my my favorite example of this. So uh, when I when I taught statistics, I had students who did not know what I was talking about. Uh, just looking at the few people who are on camera, I'm, I'm hoping this crowd knows what <laughs> knows what a mechanical thermostat is, and probably how they work better than I do. Uh, but an interesting, an interesting uh, way of thinking about the mechanical thermostat is as an artificial intelligence system, right? It takes some inputs, the ambient temperature uh, and where the dial is rotated. Um, the processing bit is a bimetal coil that expands or contracts based on the temperature. And based on the expansion of that bimetal coil, it either will or won't engage a furnace or a switch that turns the furnace on. And so this is a nice automated system, right? You set it, you say, this is what I want my ambient temperature to be. Uh, and with, with just a little more complication hidden behind, how do you make a furnace and what sort of switch? Um, you have a sensor that can make a decision about how the furnace should behave. And there are many cases where a, this is a great model for how machine learning is deployed, right? You have sensors that are IoT or they are uh, instrumentation within a software um, product, or they are user inputs on a website, right? And those act as your inputs and your processing is a trained uh, working uh, machine learning model. And your output is uh, some behavior on a website, a uh, field that's populated that says, hey, here's, here's you know, what the model predicts. Here, here's what we think the, the weather forecast will be today. Um, here's how, how risky we think this investment will be, something like that. Um, but there's nothing obligatorily machine learning about artificial intelligence. Now, the, the unfortunate part about ML, maybe there, are, maybe there are a couple, but one unfortunate part about ML is that it's sort of intrinsically difficult, right? There's a lot of hubris that goes into saying, I'm going to predict the future. And the big assumption is that stuff in the future, uh, the world in the future will behave like the world in the past did. And so before you can predict the future, you first have to gather some historical data or gather some representative data for your problem. And figure out how to assemble that data and process it in a way that creates a prediction function that works for you, right? If, if you wanted to do uh, image tagging, you can't use an unsupervised approach. Unsupervised machine learning would tell you what images are similar to each other. They wouldn't, they wouldn't tell you what images have cats in them. Um, and then you have to tune them, right? So you have, to, you have to make sure that your model isn't overfit to your training data, um, that it's sufficiently flexible to adapt to uh, the nuance of the data that you're you're putting into the training set. Um, and and that itself is a huge skill, right? Uh, this is like the analogy between statistics and applied statistics. Um, statisticians largely, well, sorry, I don't want to generalize, but um, most statistical papers are not written on this is an application of a statistic that I generated. It's, it's uh, especially historically, the field's been more about generating new statistical methods and tests or talking about the properties that those tests have. Uh, in machine learning, there's something similar, right? Where developing an algorithm or developing an approach is quite a bit different from 
using it to, to either build systems or make inferences about the world in some way. Uh, maybe second to that, right, is that, uh, or in parallel with it, as you're building this machine learning model, this system um, to, to make inferences or to try and predict the future, you have to worry about where you're going to get historical data. And for some things, they're just there, there aren't good data. Um, a good example, machine learning has been hugely successful in fraud detection. Um, this is ironic because fraud detection is a very hard problem from a data perspective. Uh, it's, it's often the case that these models are, are supervised. So you can take previously identified fraud, uh, fraudulent transactions, say at a bank, um, and, use, and separate those from transactions that have not been identified as fraud. But unfortunately, there's, if you had a solution for identifying with, with perfect accuracy fraudulent transactions, you'd never train a machine learning model, right? You'd use that rule system or whatever that process was to, to winnow the fraud from the, the non-fraudulent transactions. So when fraud models are trained, uh, they're trained on sort of imperfectly separated data because it's almost certain that some of the things that have not been identified as fraud are, are actually far. The, the final sort of difficulty that is intrinsic to ML is that the world changes, right? Your sensors degrade or people behave differently or you know, any number of things can change the success with which your model can predict the future. And these things change at, at different rates. So um, one, one thing that I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit uh, is a specific example of this, but you know, English language doesn't change very quickly. Slang can change pretty quickly, but it's still the case that you can you can create a pretty good natural language model based on uh, old news corpora and Wikipedia. You don't, but um, when it when you have, when you have, then have to adapt that language model to a more specific task, like you working as a chatbot or uh, trying to parse something on Twitter, um, people write and and would speak right, but write differently um, in digital domains than they would. Or sorry, in in informal social domains than they would in formal sort of publication domains like the like the Times and Wikipedia, and so you can you can bias your data your training data by training on um, data that are superficially similar to your the the data that you want to make inferences on, right? You train on the wrong language corpus, um, but you can also train on perfectly reasonable data and then have people introduce new new words and phrases that your model wouldn't be able to uh, account for. So you'd have to retrain. And, and that is you know, another one of the big difficulties in designing machine learning enabled software is that quite frequently, if you're working in a domain where you expect your model to drift, if you expect uh, changes in the world, then you have to come up with a way to Test your, or sorry, test your model, monitor it, uh, and retrain it um, so that your so that your system can maintain the accuracy that you would expect based on the original training. Um, in addition to the sort of inherent difficulty of building uh, machine learning models, machine learning enabled software, right, is is uh, difficult on top of that, I think. Um, one reason is that ML activities don't always naturally decompose into pointable stories and tasks, right? I know that that's kind of a cheap <laughs> cop out, but you know, if I'm just, if I'm at step one, right? If we go back to the, the original neural network that was classifying pictures of cats, if I'm just picking an architecture and trying to get an initial model trained to say, you know, how good is this thing? It, it's hard to decompose that into a, a set of finite steps that I've planned a sprint ahead, right? And, and agile software development is a hugely powerful thing. I've worked on, on engineering teams and seen how successful it can be, um, but it can be hard to apply to a research process. And, and that first step of what's my model architecture and, and is, this, you know, is this a feasible approach for the problem that we're trying to solve uh, can, can be very difficult to decompose. Um, a second is that uh, I think of these as very volatile requirements, but that it, it's often the case that there's a very small, there's a very subtle distinction between things that are relatively easy for a machine learning model to do and things that are relatively hard. Um, an example, right, is that without adding some structure, um, topic modeling can be can be very difficult. Um, topic modeling is a, 
the uh, a general approach of taking documents, right, taking sets of text and grouping them under um, similar similar topics that that text is arranged around. The grouping part is very easy, but without supervising or without giving labels to what topics you might expect, um, you can get very you can get surprising things out, right? You can get um, excuse me strings that aren't necessarily words you would expect, or you can get catch-all. Um, this is like uh, sort of the most common problem is you'll get a catch-all category where the topic is the, or, or another sort of helper word, um, or, or non-noun or verb that um, what you would normally expect as the, the topic of a, a set of texts. And so, uh, you know, the, it was years ago now, but the relevant XKCD is like, uh, somebody says, I want to, I want to know um, I want to look at pictures of a natural park and know if there's a bird in it. That's pretty easy. And I want to know what season it is. Actually, that, that's going to take about five years of research, right? Maybe it's not five, maybe it's two. But is there a bird in this compared to what season is this picture of um, can, be a real, can be a real difficult uh, problem. Uh, the other hidden, hidden in there, right, is that the difference between is there a bird in this picture and what season is it is uh, some geographic information. Um, birds tend to be visually distinct enough that you don't necessarily need to know where the photo's been taken. Um, but if you want to know what season it is, then you need to know where in the world you are. And so the, the volatility of requirements can be not just, is this hard from a machine learning perspective, but does this create coupling between my machine learning component and say my data? Or do I need to do some additional data processing or augmentation to facilitate um, what, what might otherwise be a simple machine learning task? It's also the case that um, machine learning enabled software systems are heterogeneous. They're not, they're not monolithic, right? So if I just tell you that I want to build software that includes machine learning, it's very hard to tell how hard that is or how disruptive the machine learning component will be to the rest of the system. And I think uh, a good example of this is comparing um, on the left here, you see a continuous glucose monitor and on the right uh, is the Netflix logo. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk very briefly about the difference between a medical device and a personalized recommender system. Now with a, with a, a CGM, a continuous glucose monitor, uh, a, a nice part in the United States is that the FDA regulates these and they have quite specific instructions and requirements for how, the, how you're allowed to package machine learning into a medical device. Um, one of the things that is really we don't have a, even a roadmap for as far as I'm aware yet is how to do automated retraining. And so when you have a medical device, you have some research process that generates a fitted model, right? This is your, your uh, MDs and your, and your scientists go off and they figure out, okay, based on this implanted sensor that's uh, is in intramuscular, it detects some level of particles, not, not that kind of doctor, uh, and, and I get some output that tells me what I think, what I, I'm going to transform that into my predicted blood glucose level. And that transformation, that fitted model is done. Um, it's a static artifact from the point of view of the software. And so then your software system to include that really only has to send, okay, here's the conditioning data, right? Here's the input. The model is going to generate my inference or my prediction and give that back to the rest of the system. And that's the extent of the of the coupling or the entanglement. There's not really, uh, there's no way to monitor uh, aside, besides uh, like making sure that the, the output is well-formed and doesn't produce an error or anything. There's no real way to monitor how accurate the model is um, because uh, short of somebody going and doing a finger prick or drawing blood in some way, there's no way to validate uh, what, the prediction, what the predictive blood glucose is based on that model, um, based on the, the uh, sensor for the C CGM. Well, that, that really takes a lot of complication off the table, right? That means there's no way to retrain a model. Um, there's, there's really no way to monitor it. And so it's a relatively simple interaction. So I, I don't want to say it's easy to build a blood glucose monitor. I'm sure there are many software challenges associated with that. There are many hardware challenges associated with it. Uh, my, my only real point, right, is that uh, including machine learning in that sort of device or that sort of system is not really any more difficult than anything else you might have done with that system.
on, on the other hand, sort of the, the opposite end of at least one spectrum is a personalized recommendation system. So when, uh, when you load up Netflix or, or H, uh, HBO or w- whatever streaming service, right, you're immediately given a number of recommendations about movies that they think you'll like, right? And I, they don't really think that. I'm anthropomorphizing uh, a machine learning component. But these are movies that, for one reason or another, uh, that system has has suggested will will increase your engagement or you're likely to click on or however that's operationalized. But the the way that that's maintained is quite different. The way that those models maintain their accuracy is not by not by being very carefully researched. I'm sure they're also that, but the relationship between uh, blood glucose and and normal biology doesn't change very quickly or very much, right? All humans are biologically very similar. Uh, that's not true for Netflix's catalog changes month to month as, as uh, 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 sorry, contractual agreements change, uh, people's preferences change, right? If you've watched three action movies in a row, maybe you're the kind of person that doesn't want to watch a fourth, or maybe you're the kind of person that needs to watch the next three. And so the system that they use has to rapidly update has to has to update uh, with regard not just to available options but also uh, human behavior, and so the, the even this is a, obviously a very simplified view, right? But that that machine learning component now is not just a fitted model; it might start its life as that, but the fitted model makes recommendations to the application. It's monitored, um, so we get some information about what people do in response to the the outputs of the model. Um, when that monitoring suggests that the model isn't is accurate or it's not driving engagement in the same way, it's retrained, right? So now all of the model retraining code has to be managed. That process has to be managed within the application itself or within the software system. Uh, in, in many cases, right, the way that the data are maintained um, for other uses of the system are not consistent with the way that a machine learning component needs them to be for either uh, prediction or retraining. And so now there's a specific ETL process or maybe even a separate database that, that houses that information. Um, it's not, not included here, right? But the other, the other nice part about a, a continuous glucose monitor is that there's really just one system that it has to run on. Uh, Netflix has to be able to push predictions from your phone or from a browser. Um, it's gonna have access to different compute resources based on that and, and uh, different bandwidth. And so uh, there's quite a bit more that goes into thinking about designing that machine learning, right? Now you need to potentially either limit the accuracy of your model, or you have to adapt the model that's being used to the power uh, and bandwidth you have access to based on how, how a user is interacting with your system. So that, that's quite a bit more complicated, right? Than just, you know, I have to, I have to include a JSON that, and do a little math and get, you know, a sensor output and produce a prediction. So uh, I, I haven't seen any questions or seen any hands, but if there are any questions or any hands, now's an excellent time. And if not, I'll talk a little bit about um, how, how I've approached some of these problems, um, specifically with regard to supply chain risk management, which is something that I've done um, in, in some previous startup experience, both as a consultant and as a, as a data science manager. And so sort of, um, I'm, I'm thinking of a specific example here. I'm not going to get into uh, the the most specific things um, like data sources and things, uh, both for non-disclosure reasons and because they're not as relevant to the design of the system overall. Um, But the problem overview is that we have a a company um, and they're a a services-oriented consulting group. They they work with the U.S. government and they monitor supply chain risk. And the government doesn't want another tool, right? What they want is somebody to tell them, hey, here are the companies that you need to worry about in the context of these particular devices or systems that you think are, are sensitive. So the government client supplies the, the items, um, usually the final product, right? It'll be this ship. I care about this ship. Can I make it on time? Am I worried about the provenance of the parts? You know, Tell me how risky building this ship is going to be. The company's goal is to then monitor those systems for a variety of risks, right? Foreign influence or delayed delivery, and uh, uh, 
a nice thing, right? Something that gives us some breathing room in this system is that the government client wants fixed interval reports. They don't just want an alert queue, right? So this, this could be maybe a more timely problem if what they wanted was, I need to know the second that something uh, pops up. Um, it Instead, what we're gonna say is like, we're gonna issue a report on Monday morning that tells you about the last week. So the sorts of questions I want to be able to, to answer are when will I get my boat or, you know, does, does some country know about the boat or ship that I'm building? Yeah. Yeah, I, I see. Um, okay. You see it. Okay, great. Yes. Thanks. Uh, you identified any unique software assurance practices for ML development. You know, I'll tell you, I think in general, I'm, I'm working uh, on a report about about uh, DevSecOps in the context of machine learning with frankly, some much better security researchers than I am. Um, I, I'm gonna say some things that, first of all, I'm a machine learning researcher. So uh, I, I don't wanna, I don't wanna claim special expertise here quite yet, um, but some stuff that I've run into, right? Is that when using machine learning models, especially in a production environment, we know that they're susceptible to things like data poisoning, uh, and model poisoning, right? So if somebody has access to the training data that you've used, or they're able to influence that, that training data, um, it can be a real problem. And one thing that a lot of people try to, try to do to get around that is they'll either filter out what looks like anomalous activity, or they won't expose at, at a polling rate that would, that would make it easy to make inferences about the model from an outside observer. They won't expose an API that really allows that. Um, uh, maybe a, a bigger problem is that, especially deep learning has been moving into foundational models um, where, you know, you'll take, I'm sure everybody's heard mention of GPT-3, right? Which is this giant, like many million dollar to train uh, natural language processing model. Well, if, if multiple people are using GPT-3 or it's open access, then somebody could presumably uh, buy access to it, figure out how to, how to, uh, fake things that they might want in the context of a given system and then give spoofed input to whatever system you're running. And so that can be, that can frankly be a real issue. So uh, uh, making sure that, that uh, in, this, in the same way that frankly database access, right, is quite limited, right? You don't wanna just give read write access to people or even just read access to raw data in many cases. Um, I have giving, giving people a direct line to your machine learning model could be a real problem. Um, I don't, I don't know if that exactly answers your question, but that's the, the thing that I think about with ML is, is almost always the, the data, uh, that comprise the trained model or the, because right, like the trained model is in some ways a compression of the training data. And so if, if you can influence those things, then, um, you can, I don't know, there are some great researchers I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, going to blank on his name now, but, um, once, once you can make inferences about the, the internals of the model, right? You can 3D print some glasses and make you make the model recognize you as Scarlett Johansson. And I'm obviously not, even sans beard, right? I shouldn't ever be confused for uh, a famous actress. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm hoping that hit the mark or we can, we can follow up later. Uh, but so I'm gonna, I'll talk more about this, this uh, supply chain risk management system. So we want, to, we want to be able to identify which companies are risky. Uh, German auto industry. That, I mean, frankly, that makes sense. You know, one of the, one of the things that is interesting to me, right, is that um, when you, as soon as you introduce regulation into machine learning, it tends to make them, the models easier in a way to deal with from a software engineering perspective, I think, um, largely because it, it means that you're you're limited to techniques that that you can audit in many cases, right? With the FDA, it's not like you can retrain every few seconds. Um, model updates tend to be like patches. Self-driving cars in general uh, are quite quite similar, right? Where at any time you have to be able to back up and figure out why did the car do what it did based on the software uh, and usually the model version that it was running. Um, that's Netflix is, is quite technically able, right? You could probably go back and figure out why it made it, it made a recommendation at any given time for your usage pattern. Um, there's no there's no obligation to have done that, right? So if they're doing that, it's for an internal quality control process. 
And even then, there, there are um, certainly other recommender systems that uh, drift so quickly that it's really not worth even monitoring. They just, they just immediately kick off training, either as soon as something, as soon as a model is deployed, um, depending on the training time, sometimes before the previous model has finished training, <coughs> excuse me, even, or at some fixed interval because they know that, you know, by tomorrow, um, I'm going to need some updated method of, of providing, providing predictions. All right, I'm going to keep watching the chat, but we have this problem. We want to know what companies are risky. And uh, what's done right now is that, uh, so the government provides their list of systems, um, and that is decomposed into parts, uh, which is partially automated, but um, we we brought in experts to make sure that, that the uh, parts list for a given system was um, as close to complete as possible. We would then figure out what, what company was supplying the system and then buy data to um, figure out who their suppliers and partners were. Uh, and in many cases, that was, that was at least partially a manual effort, right? There, for, for public companies, it's quite easy to figure out who's doing business, business with whom. Um, and for parts that are shipped through U.S. ports, um, it's quite easy. But it's not always the case that, especially for smaller private companies or people who are lower down in a supply chain, um, it can be very hard to get information. Uh, the next part, which is entirely automated, which is nice, is that once we have company names, um, we had data sources so we could check and see whether those companies were on any sanctions lists. We could see whether they came up in the news in the context of um, uh, you know, some sort of problematic uh, uh, practice or finding being reported. Uh, we could look at uh, uh, financial indicators in some cases. Um, then for, for any of those things, uh, we, would, we would have to manually annotate whether or not it indicated a risk. Um, now, it wasn't entirely manual, right? If something's on a sanctions list, then it's probably risky. Um, no, nobody looks at a company and goes, yeah, they got sanctioned. That, that means that we're in a good place. Um, but the, the problem then is that all that has to be aggregated. So at the company level or at the system level, you need to say, how much risk is there? And you know, how bad is a sanction for, compared with a fire at a, at a processing facility that's owned by that company or one of their suppliers. Um, and, you know, and that's also applicable to different sorts of risk, right? A fire at a facility might mean a delay for a product, but it probably doesn't mean the same thing as, as say, a, a majority foreign ownership share, which might mean foreign influences trickled into your supply chain, which is problematic for the U.S. defense industrial base. And so uh, the, that's really what this process looked like, was they they get a, a system list, bring in experts, figure out the parts that comprise those and map those onto companies, uh, see if they thought the companies were risky, and then they would produce some sort of aggregated risk score at the company level. So I, again, I'm not actually a software architect, I'm just playing one on TV. So this is not a, a proper architecture diagram, but it's the sort of thing that uh, maybe, maybe communicates this well, right? We have uh, our external components are in gray. The monitored system list is given to us. Um, we get uh, at least a partial mapping from, from uh, systems to parts and companies from an API. We get sanctions and news articles from APIs uh, that, are, that are probed using that company list that we generate. And then we do some feature engineering and uh, build a classifier. And then we have records. We have companies that have risk vectors. Uh, the, the software that, that deals with this is, is all basically running on cron jobs. Our monitored system list risk, or sorry, monitored system list basically only changes with contract changes. There have to be a change order to, to add or remove parts um, or systems. Our, our mapping that system to companies, uh, the, the automated part is a daily Jenkins job to populate uh, parquet files in S3. Um, plus we would bring in our experts and do manual additions. Uh, we had a daily Jenkins job that would populate um, different parquet files in S3 that would map, uh, that, would, that would pull down any sanctions or relevant news articles for the companies on our, on our company list. And then we had a uh, uh, one final job that once those were pulled down for the day, we would, we would update risks for companies. The problem is when we were doing this, you know, our company list 
we were basically paying for identifier data. We were paying for lists of companies with a name and maybe a, a, a DUNS number, or uh, I think uh, I, I think the DOD now has a, a new unique identifier. They were thinking about rolling it out, um, but there's no guarantee that our company list was was complete, right? We were we were relying on on API info for that. Uh, we also we had a data source to map um, suppliers to systems, um, but it ignores company hierarchy. And that can be a real problem, right? When you're when you're talking about like Lockheed Martin has 10,000 subsidiaries and operating locations. And so it can be, it can then be difficult to back out, okay, I, you know, I know Lockheed Martin is building this system, but what what part of Lockheed Martin is doing it? Because I need to know what the suppliers and partners are for that particular system. Um, the next problem, right, as we we move to the right, our feature engineering was uh, relatively simple. And it wasn't particularly um, responsive to changing data, right? The, the sort of industry standard um, is a, a big regex list, right? You would, you would pull down news articles and you'd say, does this include the word sanctions? Uh, are there, there's a list of negative words in there. Um, this, is, this is still a pro- this is also a problem, right? Because often if you read uh, news articles that are relevant to an industry, then you'll see a lot of mentions of other companies that are related to the target company. And so what you'd hate to do is search through a news article and find out that uh, company A is being sanctioned, but company B, the one that you searched for, is mentioned in the third paragraph as a competitor, right? By this system, we would pull the article back and say companies B, company B's name is mentioned in there and sanction is mentioned in there. And so this is a risky article about company B or this article increases company B's risk. Um, it's, also, it's also the case, right, with, with regex for some sorts of endings, this can work, but um, different word forms aren't allowed. So if you have, if you have irregular verbs or you have uh, 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 plural or uh, tense that's, that's added to a word, um, that, unless that's included in your, in your regex, it can, it can uh, miss that. So sanctioned and sanctions, of course, you could wildcard operator at the end, but um, that's not, not always doable. Um, and finally, the, the classifier that we we're using, right? So for each company, we'd get these, these news articles and we'd figure out whether or not there were any sanctions relevant to their supply chain. And then we'd have to combine that information. And what was done um, prior, right, historically, um, and prior to, to integrating machine learning into the system, was that they would hard code weights and they would say, okay, you know, uh, risk goes up by five if you're mentioned on a sanctions list. It goes up by 0.2 for every negative word that's mentioned in an article that includes that company's name. And that would build a priority queue of companies that then an analyst would have to go through and audit and say, okay, the riskiest looking company is, oh, it's Lockheed Martin because their name comes up in every article that says sanctions. Not that they're being sanctioned, right? Just that maybe... Uh, maybe they're listed as a competitor. They're just very big, so they're they're prone to being uh, mentioned. And so it was a very the uh, the priority queue that this created had a lot of false positives, very high false alarm rate according to the uh, the analysts we were working with. So where can machine learning help here? Right. The the goal in this case was to increase the level of automation in the system overall, um, because. There were, there were already a lot of smarts and I wasn't involved in this, right? But there, there was a lot of intelligence about taking the analyst output and turning it into a report very easily and about uh, saving all of, the, all of the labeling and annotation that the analyst did so that it could be used in models, right? But all of the data engineering architecture was built and, and no machine learning had been, had been included in the system yet. And so uh, one thing that we could do is improve the initial company list um, I'm not going to talk a ton about that because it is it is kind of a rabbit hole unless we really um, unless people are really interested in hearing about that. Uh, specifically, in normalizing vendor information, right? So we want to we want to be able to deal with these vendor hierarchies. Um, another issue, right, is that different data sources will refer to vendors differently. Um, they might it might be Lockheed Martin LTD or Lockheed Martin LLC. Uh, or Lockheed Martin Australia uh, naming a specific operating location. And so those would all be their unique strings, right? And so because the name is different, they are potentially being picked up as separate records. 
one thing that we could do using uh, our, our virtual entity resolution is to try and find the records that come from our disparate data sources that identify the same underlying entity. Um, that is that is kind of the rabbit hole uh, <laughs> that, that we're not going to talk a ton about, um, in part because it's so expensive that buying a solution is, in many cases, uh, a better a better approach depending on your level of scale. Uh, for text records, um, we can do we can do better than regex, right? We can transform those into features that are that are better for automated classification. Um, if you're familiar with machine learning, then you, you've probably heard of Word to Vec or Doc to Vec or any of these word embeddings. I mean, now the I think now the most popular thing is BERT uh, and all of the flavors of BERT. So uh, if we were doing this today, I'd probably use BERT, right, to turn a document into a vector that I can then put into my into my classifier, into my risk scoring um, algorithm. And then finally, we need to quantify riskiness at a given company, right? So we need to be able to combine all of the indicators of risk into one score or into a vector of scores, right? What the way we were interested in this problem was, you know, uh, uh, foreign ownership or foreign influence risk was separate from, from something like a performance risk where uh, the, the goods on a contract or a system might be delayed in its delivery. So the, right, this, this is um, what I was kind of referring to with entity resolution, right? It, there's a, it's going to be called Leonardo. Um, there's, there are very few places that you can go and buy information on Leonardo, even though they, they, um, one of their subsidiaries is basically the sole provider of uh, helicopter uh, cockpit canopies for uh, the Western world. Um, I do not remember the subsidiary name, I apologize. But uh, what you could do is get demographic information, right? You can probably scrape that off their website. Um, you can get things like their trade partners, they're a public company, and so they have to report those things. Uh, if, you, if you look into patents, you can get intellectual property data. Um, you can find, you can look at things like uh, Crunchbase or Owler um, to get similar companies um, or understand how, how busy they are or what their, what their affiliation of corporate officers is. Um, the problem is that there's not necessarily a guarantee that you can then combine all of that back up to Leonardo. Lots of things called Leonardo. One of them was a famous artist. And so being able to merge that information uh, across data sets under a single company is a, is is sort of a huge um, and and storied machine learning technique. Uh, that's one we won't do specifics on that one because it would take the whole talk. Uh, but what our our ML solution was um, buy additional uh, data sources to get company hierarchy information and build this entity resolution so that uh, that we can create singular views of companies. Um, a, a big reason for this too is that we this this company was interested in scaling to new data sources, and so you can imagine it'd be problematic. Um, you you'd square cubically, right? Or uh, uh, you'd scale at a square if you had to map every new data source to every existing data source. So what we needed was something like a master record that we could plug new data sources into, so that we could understand company information. Um, the second I've referred to already is that we wanted to do natural language processing instead of regex to pull out what are the relevant features, right? Uh, what are the what are the words that were used in our article that actually indicate risk or actually indicate uh, uh, valenced content instead of hoping that we had created the the single set of things that that we could search for. Um, this also means that it's easier for us once we have that vector representation of, of a document, we can combine that more easily um, with other structured information like has this company been sanctioned or uh, what, is, what was the percent change in their stock price over the last two weeks. And finally, with a classifier, now instead of uh, arbitrarily saying, hey, I'm gonna add five for each sanction and, and 0.2 for each, article that has a, a bad word in it. Um, now we can say, okay, we've, we've had analysts go through and label these companies as being more or less risky. Let's carry that forward. We'll train a model based on that and figure out which features, right? Which words or, or which, uh, which elements in that text representation vector actually suggest risk, right? How, how heavily should they be rated relative to say a, a, a sanction indicator? 
And so between the three of these, we are able to um, create with, with relatively little interaction with the existing software system, right? We could, we could plug these in in place of what were already uh, manual processes or, or hard-coded processes, right, with a, a rules engine instead of a classifier. Uh, we could generate a system that um, basically reduced their, their human effort uh, by about two thirds, um, which was for them a big win because it meant they could actually churn through uh, some of the content that, that they needed to get to the government uh, client. Um, now, the, the problem with this, right, is that the, the, well, there are a couple, right? There are a couple things that are, that are outstanding that are remaining issues with that, um, with that setup. The first is that energy resolution now requires substantial maintenance. Um, and in fact, all of these things need to be monitored maybe a little more closely because there's not human hands on every process, on every business process before it hits the customer. Um, and there's still a need for manual augmentation, right? So we don't have a, a golden record to map uh, what parts of a system go with, go with what suppliers in a company. Um, we are also, instead of, instead of training on just the, the sort of news uh, sources within the industry that we were looking at, um, we were using a pre-trained model um, in part because that meant a lower support threshold. But um, especially in news articles, uh, there's uh, different language use and also a, lar a large amount of co-reference, right? So um, pronouns are used in place of, of proper nouns after the first mention in many cases or in subsequent sentences. And this other problem I talked about, right, is that we, we never really separated the subject of an article from other entities that were mentioned in the article. And so we solved that problem by just uh, truncating the text that we were willing to, to look at, right? In most news articles, the headline and the entities in the first paragraph or two are the ones that the article's about, and, the later, and more analysis comes in later, later sections. Um, but that isn't ideal, right? It'd be nice to be able to ingest all of the text data. Um, and finally, for our classifier, there's really no fallback, right? Our, our training has to work and our classifier has to be accurate. We don't, we don't have a way other than manual effort to audit that. Um, same thing, our, our monitoring is, is relatively manual. Whenever we retrain the model, we get out accuracy on, uh, sorry, our predicted accuracy and then accuracy on sort of a golden set of records, some, some particularly important cases that we wanted to make sure we were hitting our marks on. Um, but there was, there was no labeled data that wasn't generated by humans. So there's no way to monitor that in a, in a very narrow way. Um, and there's also no unambiguously correct way to, to aggregate risky documents into a list for a company, right? Uh, there's, unfortunately, bigger companies get written about more, right? And so uh, how do you deal with the fact that when, when a large company gets sanctioned, they show up in a number of, of articles where when a smaller company gets sanctioned, you, they'll show up on a sanctions list, but it won't necessarily show up in print media in the same way. So those are a lot of considerations for the machine learning component proper, right? But the, the nice part was that we were able to take those, those three solutions and put them into, a, into an existing software system without drastically redesigning anything like the, the storage or compute requirements that, that were already associated with it. So that's everything I wanted to say about this particular example. Um, Edward, thanks very much for the, the question. I'm happy to take the, the next couple of minutes to just chat, answer questions, uh, stare at you through Zoom, uh, <laughs> anything that would be helpful for you, but I appreciate everybody's attention and thanks for coming. Sure. So uh, I guess I'll talk about this in a couple different ways, right? The, the first is, how do you know how uncertain a model is about its output? And a nice part about statistical models is that that's built into the method, right? The error distribution is, is an assumption. It's a testable assumption about the model. And so it's something that you can spend a lot of time introspecting about. Um, for, for most machine learning models, that's, that's not necessarily true. Right, and so what you end up doing is is additional analysis on the model to understand. You know, a, a really common one is if you train a model uh, with sort of a generic loss function, then all of the categories that go into the model will 
will be balanced against one another, right? So the losses aggregate, are they sum? Uh, and you have some average loss, which gets interpreted as like the, the model's uncertainty, excuse me, for an average inference that it makes. But it could easily be the case, right? We'll go back to our, our image model. Um, if, the, if the model's seeing something like a cat, uh, what it confuses for is other small mammals, right? And there are lots of pictures of small mammals. And so it's probably pretty certain about what it's seeing. But there are other things that are going to be less well represented in the training set. Um, right. And so almost certainly, if you take your, your labeled data and look at the, uh, the uncertainty or look at the, the uh, average error of different subsets of images, you'll see differences. And so how you deal with that uh, can look like a lot of different things. Right. Um, on the one hand, you know, I've worked, I worked on a fraud detection system and what that meant was that when the, when the model was sufficiently uncertain about fraud or when it, so if it was quite certain it was fraud or it was just uncertain, right? It didn't, wasn't sure whether it was a fraudulent transaction or not, but it was highly uncertain. That all went to human uh, review, right? It was only things that the model was highly certain about as being non-fraudulent transactions or very typical transactions. Um, there are a lot of other, especially sort of business intelligence or dashboard systems, right? what you need to do, or sorry, we, what many users want is some way to know how, when do I trust the model and when do I need to look at something else, right? When do I need to, to dig into the, the information on my own or find some other way of verifying this? And so uh, one, one way that you see that, right, is with say these, these uh, if it was image classification, it would be for the subset that you're looking at right now. This is the this is the change in accuracy relative to some other sort of baseline class. Um, but, it, but it's certainly a huge problem, right? And it's one that isn't necessarily built into the training of the model itself. And so requires additional, additional thinking about to make sure it gets included. Um, I see I've got a couple of questions coming in here. Uh, what information do you often see as missed from customer requirements that you need when developing machine learning? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, a, a couple things that have definitely come up for me is that people, people would love to have assurances about how accurate a model will be. And often there's an initial outlay of research to figure out, you know, what, what's even the realm of the possible here, right? Is it, is it possible that I'm going to get to 99% accuracy on, on this task? Or is it, is it possible that I'm going to meet this benchmark? And in many cases, the assumption is, you know, we have lots of data. Well, that might be true, but you're, you're measuring data in megabytes, not records that are relevant to a training set, right? Um, related to that, uh, there are many times when I've been asked about a problem and either the relevant data were not, were not persisted in some way or access was a real problem. And so figuring out how to, how to work with an existing data architecture um, can be a real challenge. Not, not technically, right? Um, in a technical sense, it's usually possible to, to figure that out. Um, organizationally, it can be a real problem, especially if you're building a model that requires going into a couple different data silos and then, and then reconciling or fusing those data. Uh, can I discuss the different frameworks and the strengths and weaknesses um, if they uh, work best on a specific type of model? Um, I guess I'm, I'm going to have to ask for a little clarification. Usually when I think of a, in machine learning, when I think of a framework, I'm thinking of like what the difference between PyTorch and TensorFlow. And uh, frankly, the, the difference between those is like, it, is there a project where a similar model has already been implemented? And so for a lot of the typical use cases, it's, it's a question of, okay. So uh, it's a question of ha has that already happened and what am I most familiar with? Um, uh, I guess an example is I was just working on a, a uh, visual localization problem. So, so you've got a, an aerial observation platform and you need to know where it is without using GPS. Um, one, one issue we ran into was uh, we, we didn't have a lot of, I, I have an extensively used PyTorch, I'm gonna <laughs> admit it in front of you and everybody, uh, but TensorFlow I have. So we found a repo um, where we had a PyTorch model. We talked a little bit about trying to port it over and instead, we ended up um, expanding the the image, or sorry, the 
container that we were using to do the uh, model serving uh, to include both frameworks because it wasn't to us worth um, trying to understand both in the amount of time that it was going to take us to, to get that project to completion. And so instead, you know, even as the ML expert, right, I was sort of treating that as a black box and saying, I'm going to, I'm going to take what's published at their word. Uh, I, we're going to write sort of a, a um, come on, conversion layer to make sure that we're getting consistent. We had a couple different models that we we're evaluating. And so we're getting consistent predictions from both um, through this translation layer, and we're, we're just going to roll with it. Uh, let's see, I'm referring to machine learning um, seeming to be interchangeable with statistical modeling. Uh, sometimes it is, right? A single layer uh, uh, neural network is, is a regression equation. And so there, there are definitely points where if you simplify enough, there, uh, there are equivalences. Um, I'll be honest, though, I'm not familiar with liquid learning. So the question is, do I think liquid learning will be uh, interchangeable, uh, replace, or an evolution of machine learning? And uh, unfortunately, I'm just not familiar with that term. I apologize. Um, I'll also say, you know, TensorFlow and Keras are, are, are TensorFlow and, and PyTorch are two of the big um, deep learning frameworks. The, uh, the thing that I've experienced that's a little stickier is, um, it's not, it's not generally considered machine learning in the same way, but there's a lot of biomechanics and uh, pharmaceutical research that makes use of Bayesian inference and the, the Bayesian frameworks. Um, so Andrew Gelman and company have a, have a program called STAN that they support. Uh, there was a DARPA program that, that um, funded the development of a few different uh, domain specific languages for doing Bayesian inference. Uh, uh, PyMC3 is maybe the other popular competitor. Uh, to, to me, there are bigger differences there, especially, you know, again, not an expert, but going between PyTorch and TensorFlow, there are at least good, good resources, and there are a lot of um, parallel implementations of models. That's not true if you get outside of maybe the, the hottest area in machine learning right now, which is deep learning. Do any examples exist of machine learning in a model-based software engineering model? I'd be interested to see how it's modeled. Uh, you... Um, should definitely talk with, uh, I, want, I want to say uh, it's uh, James Ivers um, has done some work on, you know, the, the SEI in general, right, talks about um, AI for ML, or sorry, AI for SE and SE for AI, right? We want to we be able to do software engineering with machine learning or artificial intelligence components. We also want to be able to leverage those same tools to improve software engineering. And so I have not personally worked on that, but uh, James Ivers, the SEI, is definitely the guy to, to ask about that. And if he doesn't know, he'll know who to point you to. Yes. Uh, so this, this is a big problem, right? And one of, the, one of the things that I suspect is related to the, the ease with which um, ML is deployed is how well you can monitor um, uh, that system. So for example, right, the, the supply chain risk management example I talked about, monitoring is quite poor in part because it relies on human effort, right? Whereas uh, recommender systems are quite monitorable because you can look at a direct measure of engagement and immediately know sort of instantaneously what the performance of that model is. Um, on, another example of something like this would be uh, I don't know, uh, like a, a in between, right, is a self-driving car where some of the systems are, are quite monitorable. Um, and you can look at concordance between uh, uh, redundant systems. That, again, is not necessarily true for like the CGM. And so whether, whether you have analytic redundancy and whether you have uh, data that provide fresh labels um, can be two huge drivers for how, how difficult it'll be to monitor a system. Um, I'll also say that you know, especially something we see in, in the department quite a bit is that the people who are doing operations are not just not on the same, like not in the same org structure as the people who did model development. They might not even be in the same org, right? It's quite likely that a consultant or uh, a contractor or a researcher has done the model development and now that's being deployed somewhere. And so I think eventually an answer to this is going to be that instead of instead of just passing a model artifact along, right? And this is consistent with the way that they do some things in Amazon. Uh, you also are sort of obligated to pass along um, some, some outline for how monitoring should happen, right? What metrics to look at, 
what are your cutoffs? Um, what, what are, what's your failback uh, in, in, in case you need to take the system offline or do some kind of retraining that's going to be time intensive. So I don't, I don't know that we're at, we don't, we don't have a good idea of what maturity looks like for that exactly, but some tactics are starting to bubble up on how, how can you manage that? And, and a lot of it is leverage the subject matter expertise um, to make sure that, that that comes along with the model in sort of a structured way. Sure.